I think the ETF is extremely bullish to the Bitcoin price because of the amount of money that would be flowing in. Look, I'm not a macro guy, I'm a geopolitics guy, but I can tell you that, you know, BlackRock alone has, I think last time I checked, $8.9 trillion assets under management. Mm -hmm. uh, Fidelity, it has trillions of dollars as well. Franklin, like all these massive asset managers have trillions and trillions of dollars. If just a small percentage of that went into Bitcoin, I think, you know, it would be a game changer. But there's another component as well, which is that Michael Saylor and Naim Bukele on the nation state level are being vindicated right now. When the next cycle peak happens, if you're a public company, if you're a country and you're looking at what Naim Bukele is doing and you're looking at what Michael Saylor is doing, you're saying, wow, his strategy was superior. He Holding Bitcoin on my balance sheet is actually a much better idea than holding fiat. Michael Saylor says it best. He's like holding fiat is like like holding a melting ice cube. And I think that because these are public companies and they have to adhere to their shareholders, I think that there's going to be mounting pressure for these public companies to put at least a small percentage of their treasury in Bitcoin. Like Apple and all these companies, they're holding so much cash. Nico, how are you doing, man? <laughs> long time no see. <laughs> yeah, it's been a really long time. I'm doing great, man. Super happy to uh, to be on the show. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for coming back on my show. Uh, I've been from time to time. I've been you know, uh, listening. I mean, I haven't had much time, but listening to your regular uh, talks or chats with uh, Ben uh, Perrin, uh, BTC Sessions. So it's pretty cool. You guys are like, you know, recapitulating everything that's been going on. It's it's pretty cool summaries you guys are giving. Yeah. So, yeah. So I thought, you know, um, Nico, so first of all, for, for people who, who might not know who you are, I mean, you're pretty well known in the space. You're the host of the Simply Bitcoin TV pod, um, show and podcast. And you're also, what kind of position do you have as Swan? Uh, so I'm the director of content strategy. Essentially, I uh, I run their their YouTube. I run their Rumble. Uh, any type of video related content, I probably have my hands on it some some way or the other. Um, and just kind of figure out, you know, what type of content uh, do we post on the Swan channel to number one, grow the channel, and number two to really, uh, you know, get orange pill people to win the race, to avoid the war, so to speak, like Corey wrote that piece. Um, so yeah, that's my role at Swan. It's awesome. Um, uh, really, really enjoy it. Uh, have a great team, uh, that, uh, you know, that I work with that, uh, you know, make incredible content and whatnot. So, so yeah, that's my role. Awesome. Yeah. And, and you guys have been, um, been watching this a little bit, the, um, what the educational, uh, series, uh, moderated by Natalie Brunel. Did you have a, yeah, a hand in that or did you uh, co organize or whatever, co create it a little bit, or did you have some input on that? On yeah. That? Uh, so the welcome to Bitcoin course, no, I, ha I really have to give credit to Nick and Brady and uh, Brandon, uh, they've really been pushing that forward that, of course, and Natalie, she's in incredibly talented. Uh, they've really been pushing that uh, that initiative forward. Of course, you know, I I, uh, I did a lot of the packaging. So, you know, the title, the thumbnail and and uh, all that stuff. But I'm glad that you liked it. It was yeah. really, really well received. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm really I'm really glad to have played a small part in, the, you know, the release of that specifically on YouTube and on Rumble. But uh, but yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. It's very succinct, comprehensive at the same time and very, you know, covers all the topics, all the like the fallacies of thinking and, and you know, it's just great. So, Nico, yeah. Um, 
what I wanted to like to get your like get get you a little bit up to date. Like, what 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 is your view of the things going on around like globally? Like, with uh, of course rooted in Bitcoin, with the legislation you're pushing for CBDCs connecting to. Uh, you know, censorship and and digital ID and the things that been that had been going on, you know, in Canada, where I mean, people were like, you know, uh, the bank accounts were frozen. And do you do you see like, uh, do, do you think that we are as a Bitcoin community and Bitcoin space uh, evolving um, fast enough um, <laughs> while all these things are going on? Um. Are we evolving fast enough to keep up with the monetary demons? Uh, I think so. I think that the really the the question is, are we going to win the adoption race uh, before they they roll these things out? We know that they're unpopular. We know that people, if they're informed, uh, are just they're like, why do I need a CBDC? So it's really our job to wake enough wake enough people up to this reality i'm very optimistic about the global south latin america just because i see that they out of incentive right like if if your if your fiat currency is broken you seek an alternative out of necessity and we've seen a lot of adoption um in stable coins in the global south people are just they, they they're seeking refuge a small percentage of that is bitcoin our job as bitcoiners to really wake people up to saying hey look you're only going to find uh, financial sovereignty in bitcoin but they're moving full steam ahead christine lagarde she's making videos the European Central Bank uh, I think it was a couple of days ago released a picture saying you know we respect your privacy Oh, yeah. <laughs> um here in the united states um they are here in the united states they are not only attacking the industry uh from my point of view uh they're i, I think they're attacking the right to self-custody to be honest with you uh they're trying in the doj conference that they had in regards to binance last week the amount of times that they mentioned terrorism and crypto in the same press conference i was just like star like starstruck because essentially but on the other hand it's a deja vu it's like we've seen this before right <laughs> yeah but i don't think that we've seen this before to this escalation like really? and and like a frontal, the, like, do you see that as a frontal attack to like self-custody i mean uh... inevitably yes i really believe that i think that that's their ultimate end goal uh elizabeth warren and a senate banking committee uh, I think it was three weeks, three or four weeks ago, she said the quiet part out loud. She said that, uh, you know, <laughs> people are using ever more sophisticated means to uh, skirt around money laundering laws like taking self-custody. So she's like trying to essentially like on a psychological level, she's trying to connect self-custody with crime. And then that's why the DOJ press conference was so striking because they were trying to connect terrorism with Bitcoin. And the issue isn't with Bitcoiners. Bitcoiners are just like, that's a lie. The issue is with the uninformed, right? If you are uninformed and you still consume legacy corporate media, you don't consume independent media, you don't do your own research, you're all of a sudden you're going to start connecting the dots. I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple of days ago, Two or three days ago, I, I had the privilege to be invited to the uh, to this event in South Carolina where Jack Dorsey, Luke Dash Jr., Bitcoin mechanic, uh, revealed Ocean, which is, quote unquote, the first decentralized mining pool. And it was great to be able to witness it firsthand. But Jack Dorsey went out to tweet and to tweet something about in relation to the pool. And I kid you not, I'm, I'm not joking, the day after the bbc and a bunch of other legacy media outlets said that bitcoin mining uses more water on a daily basis than entire olympic size swimming pools unbelievable so they used the word pool in their propaganda attack and 
do you think that's a coincidence the day after that announcement was not. made that's the not a coincidence was, no right so yeah it, we are in the middle we're in the midst of this information narrative trench warfare where governments are trying to convince the public bitcoiners are on the side of truth so all we need to do is just expose the lies misrepresentations and hypocrisy and hopefully we do that fast enough and quick enough where we wake up enough of the population where let's say in the, let's say in the US you have 5 to 10% of the population that are bitcoiners or anywhere around the world good luck trying to pass anti bitcoin legislation like it's not going to be possible for the politicians so they're really in a race against time yeah, that's why I put the semi title of this show, like Speed of Hyper Bitcoinization. It sounds a little bit like, you know, like a little bit um, superficial, but that's that's exactly the insight I wanted from you, like, or your your perspective. Um, hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned, you know, what's going on, you know, in the European Union and in the States. I mean, it's like all, it's a global, you know, these are global initiatives, you know, and while, while you're talking, you know, about, uh, you know, terrorism, <laughs> it's like how many trillions of dollars, you know, uh, are being or have been uh, laundered through the fiat uh, central banking monetary, whatever banking system every year, you know, and people have no fucking notion, you know, like <laughs> uh, what real terrorism means, actually, you know, would it be child trafficking or um, um, drug trafficking, uh, weapons? Uh, um, I mean, it goes through the fiat central banking system. Um, yeah that's yeah no and 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 like um senator cynthia lummis the bitcoin senator from wyoming she released a graphic during the senate banking committee where she essentially said the quiet part out loud she said that uh she said that essentially 99 percent of illicit finance is conducted through the traditional financial system no it's more than 99 percent. it's like 99.67 percent like it's it's like an astronomically uh high number um and only a small fraction is used uh you know done with crypto and quote-unquote bitcoin but the amount of emphasis that they're putting on bitcoin and crypto tells me that they're not really concerned about the money laundering like when a government is telling me like when the u.s government is telling me and they're is like the united states is a country of laws oh really you follow them like are you politician you are you have the cleanest right like everything that's been going on the last two or three years right what, whatever political side you're on it doesn't matter right the leading political opponent of the uh, the leading political opponent of Joe Biden, who's currently president, is being charged with crimes, right? So the U.S. has gone down this path, right? And not to mention all the money that's being sent to Ukraine, not to mention the, you know, whether it's the war on terrorism, the Patriot Act, um, you know, you could say that there's current dealings, if you were to believe them or not, coming out of the current president that are somewhat, you know, questionable. Um, and of course, for some reason, it's rules for Lee and not for me. So the political class, the political elite, the uniparty, the administrative state in the United States is playing by a different set of rules than the rest of us have to play by. So when they have this press conference and they grandstand and they tell us the United States is a it's a it's a country of law and order and you know CZ he broke the law and crypto is connected to terrorism and he facilitated terrorism like I'm sorry I don't like if it was 20 years ago I would have believed it maybe if it was 10 years ago I would have believed it but after what we've lived through as a country, as as the world, with the pandemic and everything that happened over the last two or three years, forgive me if I don't like I'm like, who are you to tell me that <laughs> you aren't necessarily the most honest person I've ever seen? This is the same. And Janet Yellen was part of that press conference. She was saying that the U.S. was going to have no inflation even though we printed a we printed a record amount of money 
Um, like, I'm sorry. Like, and I don't want to name all the other things because they're outside of the, the Overton window, but it, it's just like, there's been so many things and so many events that have happened over the last couple of years that I'm just like, who, like, <laughs> you guys are the biggest cartel mafia I've ever seen. Like it's insane. Who are you to lecture yeah. me or lecture the world on what is right and what is wrong? If you guys can't even follow those laws yourselves yeah. and you, and not only that you aren't even held accountable for exactly. those same laws. Yeah. So it, it, it's just, you know, the thing, the system is clearly breaking. I think Fiat is responsible for all this. I mm -hmm. think that the more they print, and the acceleration of the printing is really going to have um, is really going to have uh, downstream effects down the line, in my opinion. Yeah, and um, you know whatever we can imagine, whatever we know, uh, the the reality is actually much worse than you know we can actually. I mean, we are. I mean, the two of us are a lot. You know, so many people. You know, within the Bitcoin community and even beyond are. They have, uh, they they comprehend this, you know, the, everything that's been saying, you know, about like how fucking systemically corrupt, and fraudulent, and criminal, and beyond criminal this whole system is. But it's it's a uh, to be honest with you, I mean, sometimes I have empathy with my fellow human beings because it's 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 not easy to, first of all, to you know to be open minded because it, your whole worldview would just shatter, you know, break down like a house of cards and. It's uh, it's worse. It's like beyond imagination. It's worse than that. You know, that's why that's what I was saying. You know, like the trillions and trillions that been missing. You know, I mean, Catherine Awesome Fitz had been you know uh, preaching about this. I mean, she's an insider. She's a whistleblower. You know, and like like how many like twenty twenty one. That's that's just the official number. You know, it's been just siphoned off. You know, I mean, when was the last audit of the Pentagon? You know, or um, no, they like, failed. Missing. They failed. It was worse. They failed. Like they <laughs> failed. Like six audits, dude. Like it. it, it it's so absurd. Like it, it's so it's absurd. a fucking clown show, man. I mean, look at Pelosi. You know, I mean, how can pe pe people, you know, politicians like Pelosi, you know, who have like uh, what is it, a uh, yearly salary of what? What is it, two hundred thousand? I don't care. You know, but but you know, get a a total. Uh, um, you know, net volume of, of wealth um, in the area of whatever, 150, 200 million dollars. How do you get that? When, and, and of course, they're not going to advocate for laws that, you know, that uh, clean up this whole, um, you know, this whole fraud, you know, and, and insider trading. But that's just an example. I'm just saying, you know, it's. Yeah. And there's so many, there's so many examples of that. There's so many examples of this, just like blatant in your face theft, like, yeah. you know, because it's theft, like that's what it is. And the election um, was stolen. Come on. Let's just, let's just articulate it. They, they, come on, man. I mean, it's a fucking fraud, you know, it was stolen and and, and, and the guy is not even legitimate president, you know, I mean, it, the, the election was stolen I mean, and probably and most probably and definitely it, it's, it, it's not the first time, you know, because of, you know, because the different ways to manipulate or to defraud the whole election system. Right. But anyway, that's. Uh, yeah, uh, like, like I said, outside of the 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 <laughs> the topic of the Overton window, but I'll say one comment about that. And what I'll say is um, it was the first time in American history where uh, this never happened before. Uh, they didn't finish the counting the same day, essentially, um, and they stopped the counting. Uh, you know, late into the night. Um, I've never seen that before. Um, and that will be my comment in regards to what you said. That's good. That's good. Good enough. So, um, so Nico, what do you think about this whole, you know, maybe people are like, uh, I don't know, they're like, I, I'm, I'm hoping they're not selling hope you. Maybe they're like really credible people in the space and like, oh, once spot PTFs are formally, you know, allowed into the market, you know, probably simultaneously when, when it's going to be like whenever in January, the price is going to, you know, pump because of, yeah, I mean, I understand logically it would make sense because there's a lot of liquidity and, uh, you know, demand, institutional demand, and, and, you know, the career risk is gone and 
from a lot, maybe even pension funds. I mean, I mean, do you, do you see that uh, a, a chain reaction going and, and really pushing the price? Let's just say, even let's just say, really pessimistically to hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, which it you know, which could, which is realistic. I mean, what's what's your take on that? I mean, or is it just too overhyped? Yeah. Um, so, what's my take on the potential outcome of the ETF? Um, look, I was extremely disappointed by Bitcoin's uh, price performance last halving. I think a lot of us were. I think a lot of us were expecting a hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin. I think the reason that we didn't get to that point is because of rehypothecation from exchanges like uh, FTX that were literally selling, they weren't selling real Bitcoin. They were literally selling paper Bitcoin, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and then the most important factor, which I don't hear a lot of people talk about, is the China ban. So essentially, if you take a look at the Bitcoin hash rate and the Bitcoin price, you will see a direct correlation between when the price fell the first time, when we the first time we reached the peak, we fell, the hash rate fell before that. And essentially the hash rate fell before that because that's when China made it illegal to mine Bitcoin mining within their borders. Now, still, it's estimated that between 15% of the hash rate is still located in China. So the incentives are still winning. Um, and the hash rate today is nine times higher than before the china ban happened but that happened right in between the middle of the last bull market and i believe that played a major role in taking the momentum out of the price action because essentially all those miners needed to sell a lot of bitcoin in order to relocate to more favorable jurisdictions overseas that being said the theory the blind spot this cycle is the theory of diminishing returns. Now, it kind of makes sense if you, you know, if you're logical about it. Uh, the law of big numbers plays in. It's a lot harder for Bitcoin to get from 100,000 to 200,000 than it was for Bitcoin to get from $100 to $1,000, right? And just in numerical terms. So, that's the theory now so what i what i'm seeing what i'm sensing in the community whether it's youtube and twitter and whatever is that the price predictions and the the anticipation of where bitcoin can go is a lot lower right a lot of people are like i'd be happy with a hundred thousand dollars if that you know i'd be happy with a hundred twenty thousand dollars now I'd, I'd, I'd be honest with you that that would really bum me out if if that was the case but if we we're to learn from the last cycles, Bitcoin tends to do the exact opposite of what people expect it to do. So you could see a lot of people selling at 100K because they're thinking, OK, we're reaching the top and then this thing blow up to $500,000 in the next cycle. I think we don't know. I think the ETF is extremely bullish to the Bitcoin price because of the amount of money that would be flowing in. How much um, money are we talking about? Like um, how many hundreds of billions? Or, or look, I'm not a macro guy. I'm a geopolitics guy, but mm -hmm. I can tell you that you know BlackRock alone has, I think, last time I checked, eight point nine trillion dollars assets under management. Mm -hmm. uh, Fidelity it has trillions of dollars as well. Franklin, like all these massive asset managers, have trillions and trillions of dollars. If just a small percentage of that went into bitcoin i think you know it would be a game changer but there's another component as well which is that michael saylor and naim bukele on the nation state level are being vindicated right now michael saylor's average price is about thirty thousand two hundred and ninety two dollars that means that his investment with all the shit he got for it because he got a ton of shit he has been vindicated. He was right. He was really, really right. He was beyond right. And now all of a sudden, when the next cycle peak happens, if you're a public company, if you're a country, and you're looking at what Naim Bukele is doing, and you're looking at what Michael Saylor is doing, you're saying, 
wow, his strategy was superior. He holding Bitcoin on my balance sheet is actually a much better idea than holding fiat. Michael Saylor says it best. He's like holding fiat is like like holding a melting ice cube. And I think that because these are public companies and they have to adhere to their shareholders, I think that there's going to be mounting pressure for these public companies to put at least a small percentage of their treasury in Bitcoin. Like Apple... And all these companies, they're holding so much cash. Yeah, that's that's what really intrigues me. I mean, and it's so, melting. It's melting. It's melting. So, what, is know? there is there some kind of other forces behind that? That's just, I mean, that it's just so illogical. And what that they're not doing it. I mean, w w why is it? W w what's the what's the incentive? <laughs> what's, what's the um. So, like, what's the incentive? Yeah, to hold I, so much cash. I mean, uh... I, I I think that you know it's it's pretty straightforward. I think that essentially, you know, there's obviously there's there is a there is politically motivated uh, there is politically motivated. Um, I, I I think that there's it, some of it could be politically motivated. Uh, like the current administration, the Biden administration has made it very, very clear that they are just not fans of the industry. Um, they really, if they had the the ability, they would have rolled out a, a central bank digital currency by now. Um, they just don't have the support in Congress. Um, and I think that they're in a pickle right now. They're they're in a kind of like this catch twenty two. Um, but I, I think as a whole, like if you kind of zoom out, I think that the world is reaching this like level of peak fiat, peak centralization. And essentially, because fiat has broken the world to such an extent, the main benefactors of fiat, right, which is this government, politicians, cantillionaires, they're incentivized to censor, to... Uh, to steal, to lie, to manipulate, to misrepresent information as much as humanly possible in order to keep their control on the truth and their narrative control on the truth, because that's the only way they can keep this going. Because as soon as people start to ask the question, what is money? Why is my money stealing from me? Why am I being forced to use a money that is designed to lose purchasing power? I already pay my taxes. I never agreed to this. I think that they don't have a really good response to that. And the reason I'm saying that is because they've completely ignored like Elizabeth Warren or any of the papers that were written by the Treasury or the White House. They're essentially making the case that people are seeking, even Jerome Powell, I think, said this, like people are seeking Bitcoin because they want more and a more efficient means of payment. We have very efficient means of payment in the US. We have Cash App, we have Zelle, we have PayPal. People aren't seeking a more efficient means of payment. People are seeking to use money that doesn't steal from them. Yeah. And they've ignored that completely, mm -hmm. which tells me that they just don't have a good answer to that response. Yeah. Right. But didn't didn't Powell even in a hearing or some kind of congressional whatever hearing like whether intentional or not? I mean, say you know it is an alternative store of value to Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin is sort of a store of value. Didn't he say something like that, or am I confusing uh, something? Maybe another statement. Anyway, but I thought he 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 said it. You know that it's sort of a alternative store of value. So, I mean, some kind of hearing. But okay, maybe I'm. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, so Powell, to be honest with you, he's not that like he hasn't been like he he hasn't been um he hasn't been that adversarial compared to let's say um he hasn't been that adversarial compared to someone like uh Janet Yellen um but it, 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 that's still not to say that uh he's a fan 
because at the end of the day, I think that if you're the head of a central, uh, if you're the head of a central bank, Bitcoin is 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 the death of you because it it, it questions the very system of central banking. The, why do you think that? Why do you think that they attacked Naim Bukele so much? Look at what they did to Javier Mali. They they tried to throw anything and everything at that guy. He's a far right. He's in it. He's a libertarian. <laughs> he's, he's not a he's not a fascist. He's not he's not an ultra conservative, whatever. He's a libertarian. Right. And they're calling him a far right extremist. You know, yeah. who they also call the far right extremist mm. Naim Bukele. Yeah. So, yeah. Naim Bukele and Javier and Javier Mali in Argentina, they are threats to the very idea of central banking. And that is a big effing problem. And that is so dangerous because once they prove, and I don't know about Javier, it's too, it's very, it's too early. To but, be honest, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about Javier. I mean, I love his, you know, Austrian economics, libertarian, you know, rants. And I mean, it's beautiful. But the things that he's done, I mean, you can call it controversial. And then a meeting with Bill Clinton. This is, I mean. That was weird, right? That it's was really weird. weird. And then, you know, really becoming weird. a Zionist. And uh, I mean, I'm really, uh, really straightforward with you. I mean, this is, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm totally anti-nation, anti-religious, anti-whatever, but I'm pro, you know, human. So it. it it, it, I don't know. Is it being blackmailed? Is it being threatened? I don't know. Or is it being being put? Are there any oligarchs that have that? There are actually some oligarchs that have been funding him. But that's you should listen to Whitney Webb's one of the latest in, uh, interviews. I can send it to you. Uh, he go, she goes pretty deep into the background of Javier Milai. But you know, I still like his. You know, you know, as you said, you know, his libertarian, awesome economic, you know, like freedom and 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 you know, uh, fuck the socialists and all the, all of that. But something doesn't make sense. I mean, with Bikela, I had a more, even, you know, emotionally, you know, uh, uh, viscerally, I'm, I'm a, a more positive feeling. But yeah, that's the way it is. It's, yeah, let's see. Yeah. It's, I mean, like, look, like, if we're being honest and, you know, sincere. Like, it's like the, 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 the issue is essentially that, you know, this is a lot of American, this is a lot of American politics. A lot of American politics, the pendulum swings very hard so like it either swings to the left and then it swings back to the right as a reaction and then it kind of swings back like and forth and like like that's been the history of latin america for a very very long time that's why what naim bukele did was so extraordinary i think it's too early to tell with javier let's see like i know that one of the first things that he said is that he still has every intention to end the central bank I could tell you that is definitely a step in the right direction. Not yeah. so much if he's going to allow that, but in politics, there's this concept of the Overton window, which is the acceptable window of discussion, right? And if you talk about ending the central bank in the United States, it would be outside of the Overton window, except for Bitcoiners and hardcore libertarians. But most people would be like, nah, that's, that's, that's extreme. But the fact that you had a president elected to a country, a G20 country. Argentina is a big country. It's like 45 million people. And he's saying, let's end the central bank. And he's taking a chainsaw and cutting it into pieces. And that was accepted by the majority of the population. That is a step in the right direction for Definitely. our cause. That means something. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even if he doesn't live up, because it's very hard. He must have a lot of pressure. Um, I don't know what his net worth is, but you know, politicians that tend to be poor when they get into office, they use off they use the office to enrich themselves. Mm -hmm. Is he gonna fall into that trap? Is he gonna be noble? Is he gonna be honorable? Is he gonna have ethics and morals and all that stuff? I don't know. I have no idea. But political discourse is important, and he moved that right mm -hmm. to a really, really good side for us Bitcoiners. Um, and we need all the help we can get. Right. We have one beach. We have one beachfront, the country of El Salvador, the shining city, shining country on a hill. Now we need more countries falling like dominoes, adopting Bitcoin, making Bitcoin legal tender. Yeah. And the I've more had countries do that, the better. Mm -hmm. I had discussions like what, what, what's the critical number, the critical mass of countries, especially like in Africa or in Latin America that just need it, you know, to, 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 you know, unleash this, this, <laughs> this power, you know, of hyper Maybe it's just really three, four, five countries and, 
And then it, you know, the competitive pressure comes, you know, and then everybody's like, okay, we need to, there's, there's something we need to, to, to change, you know, I mean, just coming maybe, maybe even from the grassroots level, you know, from the people themselves, like these people are making something right, right. In El Salvador, or hopefully, you know, in Argentina soon. And uh, right. So uh, maybe it's going to become really a sudden a process as Parker Lewis would, would, would uh, call it, but we'll see. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, I, I I don't know. I don't like I don't know when, you know, I don't know like what the critical mass is. Um I think that we're living through very turbulent times mm -hmm. in history. I think we're living through two phenomenons that are happening simultaneously kind of overlapping each other. The internet started the fire and it really um disintermediated information and start and you see this with social media so the ability for governments to control narratives is greatly diminished once individuals are able to talk freely directly with each other that's why they're attacking elon with twitter look at what me and you are doing right now we're talking you know in our homes with microphones cameras and we're broadcasting and people are listening to this that didn't exist 20 years ago you had to go through the TV stations. You had to go through the newspapers. They've been disintermediated. And the younger generations, they only get their information from these sources. And governments, it's very difficult for them to co-opt every single one of these sources. And it becomes very difficult for them. That's why they're reacting like, we're going to censor the internet and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Um, and that's happening, right? So the disintermediation of information. And then overlapping that is the disintermediation of uh, of money, right? Which is like now all of a sudden, they're the governments are dealing with two problems. Like, holy, we can't no longer control the narrative. Uh, now people have a choice between using our money and using their money. And they're just like, holy cow, what is happening? And it's causing chaos. Like, they don't know what to do. In my opinion, they're scared because... The information thing is one thing, but once people start opting out of their money, that is that is their direct source of power. That is how they pay the men with guns. It goes to the roots. Yeah. So yeah. that scares them. And yeah. I think that eventually they're they're gonna have and you've seen this, they're they're gonna start saying the quiet part out loud, which is we don't want you to take self-custody. We don't want you to use your own money. We want you to use our money. And I don't know how they're going to, I don't know how they plan to ex explain that. I don't know how they, they're going to convince people to go along with that. But it's a very, very big problem that they have. Because I think ultimately what Bitcoin does is, and if the world moves to a sound money standard, is that essentially it completely changes the power dynamics between individuals and the nation state. All of a sudden, governments... If people adopt Bitcoin, there's a Bitcoin standard. Governments are no longer going to be able to pay for things they can no longer afford through with the hidden tax of inflation. If they want to pay for something, they're going to have to do it via direct taxation or wealth confiscation or direct wealth confiscation. Yeah, oh, and that becomes <laughs> very, very difficult to do. You know, especially on a massive scale, and I think over the long term that changes the 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 relationship between the individual and the government and the state. And the, look, the sovereign individual laid this out like they they predicted this in the '90s, right? And I think we're witnessing their theory. They didn't get everything right, but we're witnessing their theory play out in slow motion. Yeah. So the system wants to restrict or or control. The flow of information, the, the the fundamental basis of information, which is uh, let's just call it the, the internet. I mean, um, but they can't do that. I mean, it, it, it is the internet. I mean, decentralized enough, uh, or it's not decentralized, but is it uh, partitioned enough that you um, you know that it is preventable, or 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 are we? Do we have? Is that our obligation, or is that our mission to to you know with with Noster and other platforms to, you know, to seek out and and develop uh, other 
decentralized platforms, like totally like, you know, detached from the system. So I'm a big fan of Start9. Um, mm-hmm. And Start9 is, they started as a Bitcoin node and they eventually, they became essentially the, their products. And, and I run, uh, you know, a Start9 Server Pure Pro at my house, which is a top of the line product. And essentially it's a, it's a server, right? So I run my Bitcoin node on it. It's a full computer, but it also allows me to download other apps that make it that let's say you had a, you had that same app running at home on your computer, or on your server. Um, and start nine makes it super easy for you to do this. We can have peer to peer communications, file sharing, potentially video uh, conferencing, because essentially how the internet works now, even services like Signal that are big supporters of a free speech and, you know, uh, encrypted messages. And, you know, they, uh, supposedly they don't want people to, you know, snoop into your conversations. Um, even still, when you let's say me and you let let's just use zoom for example or we're using now me and you aren't communicating directly i'm communicating to zoom servers and the zoom servers are communicating to you and then you are communicating to the zoom servers and the zoom servers are communicating to me so the internet right now isn't peer-to-peer most services on the internet that we use it's twitter zoom youtube rumble anything you name it they're not peer-to-peer Right. They're all being hosted on servers. Uh, I think the future is sovereign computing where you're running your own server. You're you're hosting your own data. Right. And in the process of doing that, instead of everyone going through this single choke point that governments can and have in the past, uh, you know, used for their political uh, means. Imagine if everyone is just communicating directly peer to peer, which is essentially how Bitcoin works, really, especially if you run your own node. But imagine if data worked that way. Imagine if messaging worked that way. Um, I think it would be better. Now, to go back to your original question, which is, is the internet uh, decentralized? No, at the end of the day, internet is just a bunch of cables that go under the sea. Mm. You know, uh, they go into buildings. And because of that, governments can uh you know they can you know cut the wire which they have in the past during protests and all that stuff they've pulled down services um but i think that the more and more people get informed and the more and more people realize like is the government really by the people for the people or is the government for the government by the government i think more and more people are going to have problems against that and I think as the population ages, more and more, more and more of those people are going to be in positions of power, right? In positions of influence. I think as Bitcoin's market cap grows and Bitcoiners as a whole become wealthier, uh, they will become more influential. They'll be able to affect um, certain, you know, certain politics and they'll be able to, to, uh, to uh you know uh, uh, affect and influence society in a certain way to free up that society but I, I think that this is an arms race it's a continued arms race all the time uh between the the forces of, of centralization versus the forces of decentralization yeah this is um this is uh, this is exactly you know what you're saying is uh, alludes to that first question i asked you know or one of the first questions you know like are we are we fast enough? Is that because we are in a race, we're in an arms race. So uh, are we going to make it, you know, because uh, I see so much, you know, um, uh, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic and realistic, but I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, realistic, <laughs> like, like um, seeing all the, the pressures mounting up, you know, the, uh, the, the criminal entities, the central banking system, the, um, the, the EU, you know, European union. I mean, um, that's that's sometimes a concern it's con- concerning it's concerning um you know um is it but but you know we're making progress i mean look at all the developments that you know you just mentioned start nine lab whatever and then 
uh, Paulo Arudino, uh, what's his what's his platform? Keat is that Keat or something like that? The, the peer-to-peer platform. Mm-hmm. So there exactly. are things going on. There are definitely things going on. But I'm just I'm just asking myself sometimes: uh, Is that enough? Are we fast enough? Uh, do we? How much more resources, uh, brains, you know, time? Uh, do we have enough time uh, for that? Which you know leads me again to the other part because I don't want to hold you up um, too much. Um, to the other part of, of of our discussion, which I wanted to initiate, uh, is um, I know there's um, there's a topic. I don't know whether if you've had time to you know research it a little bit, but uh, as you know, you know the magnetic field of the Earth has been diminishing since the 1850s, and provably in the last decades, like um, every year by five percent, and. There are, you know, so many studies coming out, uh, of course, either not, you know, not really mainstream or suppressed or whatever, mm-hmm. astrophysicists, uh, ge- geophysicists, and all of that. So I think a realistic scenario, which could happen within the next 20, 30 years, and that's the best case scenario, by the way, because I think these Earth disaster cycles, there's different layers, different phases of Earth disaster cycles, uh, the 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 smallest one it's between 150 and 200 years Carrington event. Um, so is that something that occupies your mind a little bit? Because what we're talking about is once the communication information systems are destroyed or you know somehow damaged, you know satellites uh, grid off, satellites destroyed. I mean, Bitcoin I think is the least worry that we're gonna have. We're gonna have. Um, I think we we have, we'll have, we'll need to start from scratch and build up a civilization, and then hopefully you know plan or pre-plan a, a reset of <laughs> of the Bitcoin blockchain and then the whole infrastructure. Uh, do you know where I'm going with this, or is that uh, for you a reasonable, uh, realistic scenario and concern that you have, or is that do you think some uh, most Bitcoiners or 99% of the Bitcoiners really deny or just ignore it? The reality. Yeah, I mean, so the Carrington event was a big deal. Uh, it was, you know, it happened, I think, in the mid 1800s. Uh, essentially, it was a solar. If my memory serves me correctly, it was a solar storm that uh released enough electromagnetic radiation that it just fried the electrical systems on earth right um and essentially yeah like i mean if there that's completely out of our control you know if there's another solar storm and it does the same thing and uh it will fry a lot of the electrical components once again um but i think that humanity um i think that people underestimate the ability for humanity to innovate. Um, There's been so many natural disasters, you know, throughout history that have just been horrific. And I think that we've learned from every single one of them. And I think that there's, you know, just because something gets fried, uh, just because some electrical components gets fried, I'm sure that there is one crazy Bitcoin psychopath that is running a Bitcoin node uh, deep down in an underground bunker uh, that is, you know, going to be immune from, you know, solar winds and solar storms, so to speak. So as long as there's, you know, a couple Bitcoin nodes left, I think we'll be fine. I think it, you know, for the mining, for all the miners, you know, throughout the world, that's going to create a tough situation. But I also think that, like, regardless of Bitcoin, most of our society is just, you know, it's run on you know, electronics and electricity and it's run on via the internet. And, you know, I, I work on my laptop almost on a daily basis. I work at a remote, both simply Bitcoin and Swan are remote companies. So, you know, um, and that's just me. Imagine the entire world, you know, so many things are going to go down in that sense. So I think in that situation, like the best uh, course of action is I hope you have a lot of food and I hope you have a lot of guns <laughs> because yeah, I think it'll I'm boil saying, down yeah. to yeah we're gonna go to existential modus you know I mean uh, yeah and, and the thing is most people I mean I don't know you believe or think that these earth disaster cycles they're like you know it's like a far I mean if it was like a far off thing like what a thousand millions of years away you know <laughs> okay who cares you know but um, they're like, you know, people, you know, exponentially more intelligent, more knowledgeable than me who've been researching this and, you know, <laughs> for decades and it's overdue. 
these earth disasters are overdue and and i'm just i just mentioned caring event. i'm talking about like a bigger coronal mass ejections uh, solar shots micronova you know this could start like beginning you know uh, realistically in the 2040s and 50s and and I mean, I tried to ask a couple of people, even Adam Beck, but because I I know he's one of the calmest, the most rational, logical thinking, you know, and um, like, you know, block stream, satellite, I mean, uh, yeah, but are there, I mean, I just wanted to know, are there any alternative, you know, are there, is there anything we can prepare for, are there alternative methods to make transactions still? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a bunch of like you can send a, a Bitcoin transaction is just text like you can send that using ham radio. Um, you know, you can send that using um, I forget what the exact name of the, the networks are like radio mesh network. With mesh yeah, mesh. Radio. Exactly. Mesh networks. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's alternative ways to send Bitcoin transactions. That's not hired hardwired into the Internet. But most people uh use the internet to use bitcoin transactions because that's the most convenient way so yeah i mean it, it could totally fuck shit up like a hundred percent like if a carrington event happens today i think it will be a hundred times worse because back in you know the the mid 1800s like there was a lot of analog people you know woke yeah. up you know they still that... made some of them still used gas yeah. to, to to light their homes right um some you know they some of so, so news newspapers the world was very yeah. analog back they're so then. dependent man Nico. yeah they're so dependent you know everything is electronic and then and then on top of that the, the magnetic field of the earth i mean is re literally i mean it's, it's like exponentially like decreasing you know every year and accelerating it's like a curvature it goes around like this you know i mean uh, this is what really worries me, and, and these are—I mean, these are scientific, uh, provable facts. Uh, uh, and we just need, you know, one bad solar storm, solar flares, or micronova, whatever, and and we are um, pretty much—I mean, humanity will exist, and, and other species too. But uh, <laughs> uh, to to you know, I don't know how much percentage will survive. I mean, uh, when we're talking like the high, you know the higher orders of the Earth disaster cycles. But you know, I'm, not, I'm I'm really not a doom and gloom. I'm just trying to you know um, face reality. Like, okay, what? Do, how do we prepare? What do we need to individually, as a family, or as a society, as a as a village? You know, <laughs> like get together and uh, help one another. And this is why I'm saying, oh God, you know, Bitcoin will become maybe so trivially forgotten because we don't need it anymore. We can't because we can't transact anymore, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's it's definitely a problem, a, a possibility, uh, for sure. It's uh, you know, it's but I I think that I think that history has shown that human beings uh have a tendency to survive and innovate and dig themselves out of you know horrific situations. So I think if a Carrington event 2.0 happens again, I think it will have dire consequences. But I also don't un underestimate the ability of human beings to survive and then thrive definitely human ingenuity i mean to be honest with you i mean i'm, I'm i don't have no doubts about the human ingenuity and and uh and the genius minds out there that are, and the suppressed technologies i mean this is my hope that uh, hopefully at that time before you know sometime before you know all these technologies will be unleashed which have been compartmentalized you know within the military industrial complex and which could, you know, eventually help us, uh, protect us from all these, you know, uh, natural earth disaster cycles. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, man. I, I like, it's like you saying, like, that's the, you know, like, that's the, that's the, the catch 22, so to speak. Right. It's right. like the, you know, like I, 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 I'm, I'm extremely optimistic about the future of the human race. I think that you know you have, and I know a lot of people dislike him, but, um, like you know what Elon is doing with his, you know, his uh, crusade to uh, go to, you know, uh, his crusade to land, like move, take some humans to Mars and whatnot, and thinking from like a perspective of being an interplanetary species like i don't think he's going to see that in his lifetime i don't think i'm going to see that in my lifetime to be honest with you but that type of thinking is real because look on a long-term basis you know the 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 earth will be inhabit in inhabitable like you will not be able to live here 
uh, just because of the expansion of the sun. Right. right? Um, and it will that eventually will kill all life on Earth. And, you know, the sun is halfway through its life, st- life cycle. Eventually it will die out. Essentially, it will grow very, very big before it does that. And then it'll get very, very small and then it'll become, you know, a, a brown dwarf. And, you know, essentially Earth will either melt away first and then freeze to death, but humans won't be able to live here and no life will be able to live here. So I think thinking about how to make Earth an interplanetary species, an interstellar species is the only way to ensure humanity's survival in the long term. But I think that's all things that are going to happen outside of my lifetime. I'm just thinking think so. about the here okay. and now and the <laughs> battle of my life is just, uh, you know, fighting for Bitcoin and the adoption of Bitcoin. Uh, Because I think that uh, the adoption of Bitcoin is going to bring out the best of inhumanity. It's going to bring the new renaissance in humanity. And I think that potentially it could lead to more geniuses like Elon that are going to be thinking about, you know, more other crazy inventions to further, um, you know, propel the human race uh, for the human race to prosper. And through prosperity comes more innovations, more technology. Uh, that allows us to, you know, tackle certain problems. Yeah, I'm totally with you um, on that. I mean, uh, when it comes to the civilizational evolution and the human evolution and the and the technological evolution on every level imaginable, you know, that's what I always said. You know, this is what really excites me about Bitcoin because it will it will give us so much comfort, joy, and 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 you know, more leisure time, and you know, people can finally go after the things that they really want to do passionately, you know, and finally we can, you know, we don't need to work, you know, to, so, to exist, to survive. We're going to thrive, as you said, you know, so, um, and, and I know, you know, the technology is out there. It just needs to be unleashed and, or decompartmentalized. And this is what sometimes, you know, makes me sad that, you know, it's not only, uh, you know, material or money or whatever, or, or um, existential things that have been stolen from us, at least in the last hundred years since the creation of central banks, but actually, technological evolution, you know, innovation that's been stolen from us systematically, which is actually here, but we, we don't have access to it. And this is what really makes me sad. But, um, you know, on the other hand, yeah, I'm totally, you know, optimistic and bullish. So going back to that first uh, question, I mean, even if, uh, um, I just want to say, I mean, even if it, I could even imagine you know, Bitcoin going, because I don't care about the price, but it's it's about the purchasing power. Even if it goes like uh, abruptly, you know, like suddenly to millions of dollars. I mean, uh, the thing is, by that time, even if it happens within the next one or two years, what kind of purchasing power are we talking about? Because do you see hyperinflation at that time? Because officially, hyperinflation is fifty percent upwards, but we have already in certain, you know, services and products or you know, um, things. Uh, in a way, you know, uh, hyperinflation uh, or monetary, uh, you know, um, yeah, um, debasement. Yeah, I mean, totally. Like, it could totally lead to, you know, you just never know. Like, that's the reality. Like, you never know um, what the, uh, you never know, you know, the, the definition of hyperinflation, like how hyperinflation happens is not because the government is printing uh you know a a crazy amount of money hyperinflation happens because there's a mass uh on a societal level the population just loses confidence in the currency and all at the same time they start to sell it for everything else and then it just completely devalues Mm -hmm. so i think that the u.s dollar is the strongest currency of all fiat currencies by far Um, I think it will be one of the last to hyperinflate, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, Maybe I'm completely wrong. All I know is that I put my energy, my time, my work, uh, my money, my wealth, my future into Bitcoin. So like, I know that whatever is happening in fiat world, um, I know that I'm okay and that my family's okay and that my future is okay, Right. So yeah, like it, 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 what, what, these are some crazy times, you know, a lot of people buy into the theory of the fourth turning, I, I myself included. And uh, all I know is that I think Bitcoin is one of the best ways to protect yourself and your future self and your family's future as well. Awesome. Do you have kids, Nico? 
<laughs> I don't have kids, but I'm expecting a kid. Hopefully, so yeah, we need more Bitcoin kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have a daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I should be a father in February. Um, and that should be that should be interesting. So oh, I'm really looking way. forward to that. Thank <laughs> awesome. you. I appreciate that. So happy for you. Well, anyway, um, Nico, um, yeah, it was um amazing to talk to you again and you know, get your insights and um yeah, can you do you have any final uh, words or uh, and and where can people find you? Is there anything upcoming? I mean, uh, anything publication wise or anything you want to tell my audience? Yeah, um, so I mean just keep tuning into simply bitcoin uh you know uh swan's dropping some awesome content too and uh you can find me around and uh thank you so much for the invite and for having me on uh, i had a great time all right nico it was great talking to you <laughs> see you next time thanks man hopefully in person bye